Welcome to TCT 2024. I'm Nicolas Famigan from the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, and I'm joined here by two colleagues from the Cleveland Clinic, one in London, the other one in Cleveland itself. Uh, Bernard Prendergast on the far end and Amar Krishnaswamy next to me. Amar, um, you have been discussing an interesting trial yesterday uh, related to um, a innovative transcatheter balloon expandable platform, but a, uh, an MRI study. What were the details? Thanks, Nico. Appreciate the uh, kind introduction. I think it'll be best if we go through a few slides and yeah. we can set up this understanding of flow dynamics and how it might be related to left ventricular remodeling and function. So the Duravir is a uniquely designed valve. It's a single piece uh, pericardial tissue that's shaped with a biomimetic design. Uh, to mimic the performance of a healthy aortic valve, you can see here, there are a number of unique features of this valve, but the thing that's most germane to this conversation is the leaflet design and the long coaptation to hopefully improve laminar flow. Now, the early studies have demonstrated excellent safety and uh, feasibility of this valve platform. And interestingly, in a group of patients who are only small annulus in the first in human and uh, EFS studies, we see excellent uh, gradient and EOAs as shown here, a mean gradient in the seven to eight millimeters of mercury range, despite a small annulus. Now we know from a lot of the work that uh, Philippe has done to show that left ventricular hypertrophy is actually related to progressive heart failure, worse outcomes, and we consider now a stage one in the cardiac damage schema of aortic valve stenosis grading. We also know from numerous years of study that aortic valve replacement, whether transcatheter or surgical, does provide some LV mass regression. Mm -hmm. And in fact, an earlier study from the partner series which used echocardiographic analysis, which is perhaps a little less robust than MRI, was still able to show about a 14.5% average regression in ventricular mass after TAVI. And those patients who had more regression actually had better survival. So when you start to put these ideas together between aortic valve stenosis and ventricular hypertrophy and outcomes, and you delve into it a little bit deeper, we can see that as patients move from healthy to severe AS, they start having more disordered or more non-laminar flow in the aorta. And we can see that aortic valve area and disordered flow are the biggest contributors to LV mass index and regional uh, wall mass. And so the question is, not only fixing the aortic valve to reduce that burden on the left ventricle, but could improving or restoring the healthy laminar flow also be a factor in LV mass regression after TAVR? Mm -hmm. And so this is where a lot of the MRI studies of the Duravir have come into place. You can see here very nicely, sort of graphically, the laminar flow in the healthy aortic valve. It's sort of a clear spectrum of color, as opposed to the aliasing that you see with any of the other TAVR or surgical platforms shown to the right. Yeah. And after placement of these valves, there's no restoration of the laminar flow back to a healthy uh, amount. And so... In the Duravir early studies, there is a nested CMR substudy to look at Duravir patients compared to a healthy group of controls. These were appropriately matched controls looking at uh, root dimensions, root anatomy, angulation to take out any confounders in the matching algorithm. And what's very interesting about this is if you look after Duravir, and this is a relatively early follow-up, only six months, you see that the sort of robust parameters of laminar flow are much improved after the Duravir. And in fact, they're improved to levels that are uh, comparable to healthy controls. And if you look at it a little bit more uh, granularly, you see LV and diastolic volume reduced by about 8%. You see LV and systolic volume reduced by about 19% and LV mass by 22%. And most importantly, perhaps, these are all values that are now comparable to the healthy controls. And so the idea is that in these patients who've undergone Duravert TAVR, just the idea in 2024 of putting in a valve that gives you good hemodynamics, that gives you a, a safe platform, is just table stakes. What can we do better? How can we think about longer term outcomes? How can we restore sort of normalcy to the left ventricle? And this seems like sort of thought provoking or hypothesis generating data. So 
I think that the important part of this sort of early understanding with CMR, this restoration of laminar flow that's comparable to healthy individuals that shows early LV reverse remodeling is something we need to study a little bit more closely. Mm. So the pivotal trial of Duraver randomized between the Duraver platform to commercially available balloon expandable and self-expanding platforms will have an MRI sub-study. So we're gonna look at MRI data in all of these groups of TAVRs and understand, is there a difference that goes beyond just, okay, the gradients are better and you've restored a healthy aortic valve? Thank you very much, Amr. About uh, This is a very nice overview of, first of all, the study, but also the potential implications. Um, Bernard, when you, when you hear this, are we entering a new era of research with these CMR flow dynamics that we now can measure? Because well, it's quite intriguing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, unquestionably, and I think, Historically, we've underutilized CMR in, in our research protocols. I think that partly relates to the simplicity of access, sometimes the feasibility of MRI in, in our elderly, frail patients. And also, I think, to be honest, a greater application of MRI in Europe compared with the US, historically. But there's no doubt that the application of this mode of imaging to learn more about prosthetic valve function will be very, very important in our understanding because we now recognize that optimization of flow and hemodynamics is, is a very important part of what we're, what we're doing for our patients. Yeah. So, so talking about this optimiz optimization of this laminar flow, the return to laminar flow, um, we've seen uh, the presentation of two uh, upstream TAVR trials, uh, the TAVR unload and the early TAVR. Um, is this something that you would also um, consider, this return to laminar flow, uh, when, you, when you're dealing with upstream TAVR in terms of, well, this might be relevant for durability over time. And obviously in those strategies, you wanna treat the patients earlier, but there might be consequences in terms of durability. Yeah, so. I think it may also plays into the, uh, the cardiac damage story as well. Yeah. So we know that turbulent flow isn't good you know, yeah. in very general terms, whether it's in native valve disease or whether it's in uh, degenerating prosthetic valves. Yeah. So laminar is better than turbulent, and that is gonna reduce the amount of cardiac damage potentially, and hopefully that will also have implications for durability yeah. in terms of the, the longer term outcome. So Amar, we, we know from, from the, the partner trials that it's very difficult to reverse the cardiac damage. Do you have, uh, reasons to believe that we will be able to do a better job when we restore the laminar flow? I think it's an, I think it's an interesting sort of conjectural hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, specifically as we're talking about treating patients earlier with the knowledge that we're probably missing the boat in a large number of patients when you start thinking about the ramifications of AS and cardiac damage before people become truly symptomatic and we treat them. So to me, what's most interesting about the MRI sub-study is that maybe it's okay that we miss the boat a little bit, but then we can still catch up if we restore the laminar flow, if we see these negative remodeling consequences regress, and we see improvements in LV dimensions, we see improvements in LV mass, maybe that gives us a little bit more leeway. I think... Another interesting, again, totally conjectural hypothesis, but specifically related to Duraver, is that in some of the benchtop work that's been done uh, in Vancouver, they've clearly shown that when you have uh, valve under expansion, when you have leaflet pinwheeling, things like this, that's a contribution to leaflet thrombus or halt. It's a contribution perhaps to early degeneration of the valve. And interestingly, with the Duraver platform, and probably because of the very long leaflet co-optations, no matter how much they under-expanded these valves, they did not see leaflet pinwheeling. So what that means for the long-term durability is not known, but is kind of an encouraging finding when you're talking about treating patients in an earlier way. Yeah, so you mentioned the Global Pivotal Trial. Um, it is about to start next year in the summertime. Um, can you, do you have some more details there? Are we talking about the, the entire sizing spectrum or is it just limited to smaller sizes? So, good question. So as I mentioned, the early feasibility and the first in human was only using the small annulus 23 millimeter valve. Uh, after the pivotal gets underway, 
It will include the entire valve sizing spectrum, so all of the annuli sizes that we treat now with the other commercially available valves. And it's going to be randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion between the Duraver and commercially uh, available balloon expandable and self-expanding valves. So I think that's going to give us a lot of both clinical comparative data as well as the MRI comparative data. Is, is this what we're going to face the next couple of years, Bernard, like the head-to-head -head comparisons of device platforms? Yeah, it seems that we're entering that era, doesn't it? You know, we've had a few studies out already, but there's several more ongoing. There's newcomers from Asia and elsewhere in the world. Yeah. These are exciting times. Exciting times and also fascinating new technology with this biomimetic uh, valve platform. Uh, with that, I think uh, we are coming to the end of this session. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you very much, Amr. And I hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion. Goodbye. <laughs>